It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. You already loses to Stony Brook last night, and they lose for one reason and one reason only: rebounding. Great Danes out rebounded by Stony Brook, forty-four to thirty-one last night. A rematch of the America East title game from March, a game that you Albany won to stamp their ticket to the NCAA tournament for the third consecutive year. That game played in March. Fast forward to last night, ESPNU. It was a big game for the Danes. Nine o'clock at night was the start. You Albany goes down, sixty-nine, sixty-three. A game they led by one point with thirty-eight seconds left. Rebounding was the difference. Zach By, you Albany men's broadcaster, he will join us at 945 today. He was on yesterday on the Jeff Levac show, and he said the key to the game was going to be this. And I always, during the broadcast, and even as a player when I think back, when I think of toughness stats, and to, to illustrate what I was just talking about with the competition and competitiveness and willingness to fight, I look at free throws attempted, the rebounding margin, and points in the paint. Well, Three things there that Zach mentioned. Rebounding margin, free throws attempted, and points in the paint. UAlbany, 32-32, dead even with the Seawolves in the paint. Points in the paint, 32-32. to Free throws attempted, UAlbany outshoots uh, Stony Brook by one in the free throws attempted. The difference in the game was rebounding, 44-31. Stony Brook has the advantage on the glass, and that will come back to bite you almost every single time. It's like turnovers in football. You can win you can win the rare game where you've got five turnovers and the other team has one. Or you're minus three in the turnover battle, but you won't win consistently. You can win the occasional game where you're getting out-rebounded by 13, but you're not going to win too many of them. And last night, late, it reared its ugly head for you, Albany. Second chance point opportunities for Stony Brook. Uh, defensive rebounds limiting to you, Albany, to one shot. The Danes just could not control the glass. That is not something we usually see from a Will Brown coach team and from this UAlbany team that has been to the NCAA tournament three times. UAlbany, they executed the game plan nearly to perfection. Jamil Warney, the two-time reigning player of the year for Stony Brook. He's 6'8". He is bigger than any player in this conference. He's bigger than any player UAlbany has. 17 points he finishes with, but in the first half, they limited him to just seven minutes of play. He was in foul trouble early. Danes got him off the floor. You already did exactly what... If you say, look, you need to be able to beat Stony Brook, we need to take Jamil Warney out of the game. For the first half, they did that. For the first half, they did that. They got double-figure scoring from Evan Singletary, Ray Sanders, and Peter Hooley. They got a bench contribution from Joe Cremo and Dallas Enema, although Cremo scored six points, not his 10-plus that he had been scoring almost every single night. They got a bench contribution. What they did not do was rebound. 44-31, the margin on the glass. But remember, Stony Brook is a team that has won the regular season championship before, and they now have a 6-0 record in the league. UAlbany's 4-2. They have won regular season championships before, and it's been the Danes as that team that stamps their ticket to the NCAA tournament. So don't read too much into this loss other than it's a loss in January. Those two teams are going to meet again at Sefgu Arena later in the season. As far as last night goes, remember, it's it's not a meaningless game, but it's 9 o'clock. It's on the road in a brand-new gymnasium, sold-out building, record crowd for Sony Brook, 4,100 people, big crowd pumped up. They're coming off the emotion of, of last year's loss in the tournament. They had the best player in the league. They have... The second best point guard in the league in Carson Purifoy, who I still think trails Evan Singletary, but he had 20 points last night. They, you all had all those factors going against them, and they still had the lead with 38 seconds remaining. Still had the lead on the road in a hostile environment. Record crowd. New gym. Best player in the league going against them. Dane still led the game with 38 seconds remaining. It was great for you all to get that exposure on national television. ESPNU, Rebecca Lobo, Olympian, former UConn player, uh, just... Uh, WNBA player, she was on the color call. It was a great day for the great Danes in every single way except the final score. You Albany will be better when they take the floor again on the glass. You can believe that. Will Brown will address that with his team. It is Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. I'm your host, Brady Farkas. We do this every week from 9 to 10, talking all the local sports that you crave. And locally... Kevin Herter and the Shenandoah Plainsmen 
out to a 16-0 and start this year. They won their 40th consecutive Suburban Council game on Thursday when they beat Albany. They won the state title last year. They're out to a 16-0 and start this year. Undefeated in the league, undefeated overall. Kevin Herter averaging more than 20 points a game, and that number would be much, much higher if Shen wasn't blowing out 90% of the teams that they played. He's not even playing most fourth quarters. Not getting a chance to jack up those point totals to to the level that you that would really make you open your eyes. 21 points a game for Herter, but it could be 28, 29 if they needed it to be. He's going to Maryland next year, and everyone says to me, Brady, look, we, we know this kid's a good player. We know he's a good player. A division one player too. He's a six four point guard, six five point guard who can shoot it well. But what's the difference between him being a, a division one pl- just a division one player and a guy who's going to Maryland? Is he really going to play? Everyone always says. Is he really going to contribute for the Terrapins? Is that really possible? Well, that's what we're about to find out. On the phone with us right now is Dustin Clark, the assistant basketball coach for the Maryland Terrapins, asking about Kevin Herter. So, Dustin, thanks for being with us. Kevin Herter, what is it that you guys liked about him? What makes him a fit for your program at Maryland? Uh, Brady, you know, there, I think that's a long list when you start talking about Kev. Um, you know, just in no particular order, things that we fell in love with whenever we started recruiting him was, um, you know, first of all, just his skill level. You know, he can really uh, dribble, pass, and shoot. And then, you know, his size for the position. He's got great size. He really thinks the game. He's got a super high IQ. And, and he wins. He wins. You know, seemingly everything, you know, every um, you know basketball team that he's on, he wins. And, heck, even other sports funny, you know, Coach Turgeon, our head coach, um, I think after we left the, the in-home visit, he was like, you know, he's like, this kid, he's like, he's just a winner. He's what a great athlete. He said, he, he's the guy that, you know, beat you in pickup, and then, you know, you go play golf in the afternoon, he beats you in golf, and then you go play pool that night, and he beats you in pool. <laughs> you know, he's just he's just a great athlete, and, you know, obviously I think that has a lot to do with his parents, um, but, you um, you know, he's a great athlete, high IQ basketball player, very skilled and good size is kind of what attracted us to him. Obviously, we're we're in the middle of this season. You're not even really thinking about next season yet, but obviously the conversations get had as to what Kevin's role might be right away and then throughout three, four years. Where, where kind of do you guys envision him uh, in your program next year? Yeah, well, we're, we're expecting him to be able to come in and, and, and contribute immediately. Um, we're going to need that from him. And that's kind of, you know, was our message all along as we recruited him. And, you know, Kevin's young. Um, you know, he's really young for his grade. He really, uh, a lot of kids that um, are his age are, are juniors in high school. But we're not worried about that with Kevin just because of the way he approaches life and the way he pr- approaches basketball and academics. think he's, he's very mature. And um, just think because of uh, the preparation that, that, that Tom and, and Aaron and, and his coaches with um, – Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. On the phone right now, Dustin Clark, Maryland basketball assistant coach, talking about Kevin Herter, the Shen senior, who will play for the Terrapins next year. And, Dustin, I'm an admitted recruiting nerd. Take me through the recruiting process with Kevin from from start to finish. That's what's crazy about recruiting, Brady, is everything, you know, every recruitment is different. And, um, you know, Kevin Kevin's was a unique recruitment for us because the first time I saw Kevin, was last uh, April, I guess. Um, I think it was April, March or April. He, he was playing his last game of the year, so it was late is what I'm saying. Um, they were playing uh, Wings Academy there um, at the University of Albany. And, um, you know, funny thing is I'm, I'm surprised we got Kevin because, um, you know, I sh- they hadn't lost a game all year last year, and I show up and, and they lose the only game of the year. <laughs> so I'm glad that he didn't view uh, me and the Terps as, as, a, as a bad luck charm. But um, that was the first time that I saw him play. Uh, it was late in his junior year. A lot of guys, you know, by that time of their career, we've identified them and have already been recruiting for a long time. But I got a tip from a good friend of mine um, that said, hey, there's a, uh, a really good player up here in, in Albany that, that you need to come check out. And so I did and, um, and really liked him really liked him the first time I watched him. 
And then um, the next game he played wasn't until a youth season in the spring with the City Rocks. And so that was that was the first opportunity that Coach Turgeon was able to see him. And, you know, the whole love at first sight deal, um, that's not that's not only true in dating. Sometimes it works out way in recruiting. And Coach just uh, really fell in love with him as a player. Um, the, the very first time he saw him and um, Paul and offered him a scholarship after that weekend. Uh, they were playing a tournament in Virginia. And uh, that, that's really what, what jump-started the recruitment. And then, um, you know, we just went through the spring, uh, you know, building a relationship with, with Kevin and, and, and his family, you know, his whole family, Thomas and Jillian and Megan and Tom and Aaron. And, um, and then, you know, went through July, watched him play again in July. He actually, um, uh, Tom and, and, and Kevin actually stopped and made an unofficial visit in August after they were playing a baseball tournament in Richmond. And then uh, from there, um, uh, you know, they came for their official visit. The, the, the family did come for the official visit um, in in September, and we, we just had an unbelievable visit. You know, it just felt like uh, the, the best visits, Brady, are the visits that don't don't feel like work. You know, it just it feels like family. It feels like you're spending 48 hours with family and just hanging out. And Kevin really um, got a great feel for our players. You know, we, we, we try to recruit character first. And, um, and we got a great group of guys in our locker room, and I think Kevin felt like he would really fit in. And, you know, they were they were kids of like mind. And um, and so we had a great visit, and, and I believe it was uh, the next day uh, he called the coach and told him that he wanted to be a Terp. Dustin Clark, Maryland basketball assistant coach, talking about Kevin Herter on Capital Region Sports Saturday, brought to you by Mohawk Honda. And, Dustin, you mentioned Kevin's family. His father, Tom, played at Siena. His brother, Tom Jr., is going to Siena next year after spending this year at prep school. I've heard Siena coach Jimmy Patso say, who has some Maryland roots, that we could – I want to know, are we going to get a Herter versus Herter showdown at some point in the next four years, Maryland and Siena? <laughs> I tell you what, um, the program that Jimmy's got and, you know, the, the players and the success that he's always had everywhere he's been, um, I'm not, I don't know. I, I might be a little more than, um, that, 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 than we're uh, bargaining for. Well, that is certainly something that we in the Capital Region would love to see. We'd love to see the Herders go against each other, Siena versus Maryland. That's what uh, that's something we want to see happen, Coach. Dustin Clark, assistant coach at Maryland. They're getting Kevin Herder, the Shenandoah with standout, next season to join their program. They're off to a great start this year. We'll certainly see them in March. Dustin, thanks for the time. Thanks, Brady. Absolutely. Just great insight. That is hearing from Dustin Clark, assistant coach at Maryland, about Kevin Herder. Expected to contribute right away. That's what we want to hear. We love it when the Capital Region guys get a chance to play and play often from Joe Cremo to Jaleel Nails who we had on the show a few weeks ago who's out at uh, who's out of Central Connecticut now starting. Jalal Cantor who's a senior from CBA at Kent State. They're Division One players coming out of the Capital Region every single year and we love it when they get a chance to contribute. So Kevin Herter has Shen unbeaten right now and next year he's got a chance to go in and play right away at Maryland. It is Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda. For the people that are in high school currently, a bunch of big games last night. The Shen girls beat Albany 69-42 in a matchup with the area's top two suburban council teams, two state-ranked teams. Uh, Sydney Brown, 22 points for the Plains. McCarley Boland had 18. 40 points on the boys' side for Kobe Lufkin in a big Argyle win. Schenectady, a one-point winner over Saratoga. And Schuylerville by two over Johnstown. I've been telling you for two weeks, Siena will stay afloat in the absence of Marquise Wright. There is one guy who is leading the charge for the Saints. we tell you about him next. It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. Javion Okanyemi is saving the Siena Saints basketball season. Saints lose Marquise Wright, one of the best point guards in the country, a few weeks ago before a game. Uh, against Vermont right around the holidays. And everyone wondered if the sky was going to fall on the Siena season, a team that had looked really, really good in the Albany Cup. Everyone around the area took notice and said, wow, the Saints are back, including myself. The Saints are back after they beat all U Albany at the Times Union Center back in December. Oh, but Marquise Wright goes down. The sky is falling. No, enter J.B. Onoganyemi, the Troy High School product. The junior has completely transformed his game and has helped take over this team. Saints beat Ryder the other night. They're now 12-7, and 5-3 and three in MAC play. Javion Ogunyemi scores 19 points, gets 10 rebounds, has scored double figures in 16 of 19 games this season. 16 of 19 this season. 
He's got double figures in scoring. He's got double figures in rebounding in three of his last six games. He had a blocks against Quinnipiac a uh, week and a half ago. J.B. Okanyemi has been disparked. This team is needed, and the moment for him came in the Albany Cup. As far as I'm concerned, in the second half of the Albany Cup, in the last 10 minutes, he threw down three slam dunks that ignited the Times Union Center crowd, and it made the TU Center feel like we felt when it was Edwin Ubelis, Alex Franklin, Ronald Moore, Kenny Hasbrook, and the Saints were getting to the NCAA tournament and winning MAC championships. Those last 10 minutes of the Albany Cup provided by J.B. Ogunyemi, that helped Sienna. That helped it feel like Sienna felt four, five, six years ago. And if Sienna is going to tread water without Marquise Wright, and I believe they will, they have to get contributions from their new backcourt from Nico Clareth and Kenny Wormley and Kenny LaRose and those guys. But the big men, Brett Bisping, and specifically Javion Ogunyemi, have had to step up. And thus far, they have done that. He's really a different player than he has been in his first two years for Sienna. Last year, he had only one double-digit rebounding game. One double-digit rebounding game. He's had three in his last six games, had 19 and 10 against Ryder the other night. JV and Okanami, we told you a minute ago, we love to see Capital Region guys who make it at the Division One level. We love to see the guys that we watch come up through our through our high schools, through our communities, play well at the Division One level. And JV and Okanami is one of those guys doing just that. He's one of the guys at the top of the list, 19 and 10 the other night for the Sienna Big Men. It is Capital Region Sports Saturday. Brought to you by Mohawk Honda. Well, Sienna U Albany, not just the only big rivalry collegiately in the area. Tonight, the Mayor's Cup, you, uh, RPI and Union on the ice, 730 at the, Times Union, at the Times Union Center. And this rivalry is one that, remember, it's contentious. It's contentious. Remember the on-ice brawl a few uh, two years ago that resulted in suspensions with the two programs. We had Seth Apper and Rick Bennett, the head coaches, going at each other on the ice. That's hockey, but it's not supposed to be in college hockey. And that rivalry gets renewed again tonight for RPI. They've taken both meetings already this year. This is a non-conference game. RPI won the two conference games early in the season back in October. Union won last year's game by a score of 8-3, to three, but RPI comes in extremely hot this season. They're in second place in the ECAC. They just tied number one nationally. Quinnipiac uh, on Thursday tied that game 2-2. Two to two. A game they were winning with nine seconds left, had a chance to get the 2-1 win on the road in Hamden, and were not able to uh, hold the deal. It goes to overtime, and, and RPI ties, but they still get a crucial point in the ECAC standings. RPI 11-3-5 and five in their last 19 games. The engineers, they aren't losing. They aren't losing. Union's going to have their hands full today with this engineer team. And if the game is close, if the game is close, RPI has a distinct advantage. They are 8-2 and two in one-goal games. And they won five of the last six against Union. So all signs right now are pointing engineers. If you're a college hockey fan and you're going out to the Times Union Center tonight, RPI is the favorite. Remember, Union won the national championship two years ago. But the script has flipped thus far this season in the Capital Region hockey scene. RPI under 500 the last two years. Well, now they sit in second place in the ECAC as we are more than halfway through the season. More than halfway through the season, they are second place in the ECAC. Mayor's Cup tonight. Head coach of RPI, Seth Appert, on what makes this game so special. As Rick mentioned, the student-athlete experience, you know, you... With the exception of the Frozen Four, and obviously uh, Rick's teams have been there twice, winning it once, and, and we're fighting our tails off to get back there. Uh, with the exception of the Frozen Four, uh, this is probably uh, as great of a student-athlete experience as, as our guys will have either at RPI or Union. The matchup is is big. The tension is very, very real. Again, Seth Appert talks about respecting the Dutchman, but listen to the wording that he says here in this following cut. Seth Appert as well. Um, and we just have so much respect for them. You know, there's there's a healthy amount of animosity uh, between the two teams, but, it, but it's healthy because there's a lot of respect. Uh, we have a lot of respect for what Rick uh, and his players and their staff have built over there and how good their program is, how hard they play it. We have a healthy amount of animosity. We have respect. But we have a healthy amount of animosity. Um, you know, there's there's a healthy amount of animosity uh, between the two teams, but, it, but it's healthy. 
animosity. These two teams, they don't like each other. They don't like each other. And RPI is fighting to get back those Capital Region fans that left on the RPI bandwagon when they were going under 500 and jumped ship over to Union side when they were winning the national championship. Well, RPI... 11, 3, and 5 in their last 19 games, 8 and 2 and 1 goal games have completely flipped the switch. And that rivalry renewed tonight at the Times Union Center, 7.30 in the Mayor's Cup. The Mayor's Cup will be awarded to the mayor of the city that wins either Troy or Schenectady. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. I have no idea how Union is going to do on the ice today. I have no idea how the Dutchmen are going to do on the ice but I will say this, that next year, Union is going to be, it, they are going to show significant strides on the gridiron. And Brady, why are we talking about college football right now? College football season is over. The NFL season is almost over. Union went 0-10 this year. Head coach John Adino, who had been there for 24 years, he, he retires, resigns, stepped down, although it really seems like he was forced out. That's just my speculation, but it really seems that way a la Tom Coughlin, but Union hires their new head coach this week, and it's Jeff Behrman, and Jeff Behrman was a was the offensive coordinator at Stony Brook for the last 10 years, so he's been around Division One programs, FCS programs, had high-powered offenses there, and, and I got a chance to speak with him this week, and you can listen to the full interview at 1045theteam.com or go to youtube.com slash team1045, and this guy, he just gets it, okay? He is... He's he's been an offensive coordinator for ten years at the Division One level. He knows what it takes to win. He knows what it takes to recruit. He knows what it takes to to sell a guy to come to your program. And then he know he's going to know the X's and O's. You don't just put up the numbers that Stony Brook's offense has put up at Division One without knowing how to coach a little offense, knowing how to get to to work with a great staff. And I asked him specifically. I said, "Look, you you, you were in Division One for ten years. Ten years. I'm sure you had other options." if you wanted them as far as being a head coach. So simply put, why Union? This was Jeff Behrman's answer on why he chose to come to Union. Why Union? Yeah, I've been asked that a lot. Uh, it, it's a special place. It's a place that has a, a proud tradition, um, obviously academically and athletically. I think it's a place where, you know, you can you get the best of both worlds in terms of uh, being a, a student athlete and um, you know with my background as a division three athlete and coaching at some division three places it just a division three model really resonates with who I am as a person and so he gets division three he's from John Carroll he coached at Trinity College beforehand then he went to division one and now he's back so he's been through the gamut he's seen it all and division three it's a different animal no no athletic scholarships there so you've got to go out and your recruiting is going to be difficult You've got to not only find kids that are great football players, you've got to find kids that are great students that can get into a prestigious university like Union, and you've got to get kids that can afford it or afford most of it, even when you throw in some academic money or financial aid or whatever. It's over $60,000 a year to go to Union. So his hands are going to be full in recruiting, but he gets it. He knows what makes Union a special place. He knows what makes Division Three a special place. And then the biggest thing for me that I had to ask him, I said, Coach, your guys went 0-10 last year. You're going in there trying to change the culture. You're trying to build the optimism, get the program back on the uptick. What's the first thing that you say to those guys? Jeff Behrman's answer. Jeff Behrman's answer. The, the first message I gave them is we're never looking. We're not looking back. We're we're moving forward. You know, let, let's uh, let's not let's not look in the rearview mirror. Let's look right out the, the windshield and, and let's let's you know have put our own foot forward and, and uh, create our own destiny. So. I'm on record as saying that I don't like what happened to John Adino. I thought he deserved to, to keep his job or retain his job or whatever verbiage you want to throw in. I thought he deserved to remain the head coach at Union College. But Jeff Behrman is now the guy in charge. And I'm telling you, if you're a Union fan, a Union alumni, a Union player, a parent who's thinking about sending your kid to play at Union, this guy, he gets it. He understands what is needed to rebuild the program, to take it back to the NCAA tournament level that it was at for so many years. He knows what he's doing on the field. He knows what he's doing off the field. This guy will be a success in Schenectady. They're not going to go from 0-10 to 10-0 in one year. Not going to happen. But if you start looking in two, three, four years, Union will be better, and they will be in a position to vie for a Liberty League championship. Again, that full interview available at YouTube.com slash Team1045. We are brought to you by Mohawk Honda here on Capital Region Sports Saturday. And at Mohawk Honda, they, they just have unbelievable 
customer service. I mean, you know that, right? You, you've heard me say it all ever since this show started. They want to be number one in customer service because they strive for perfection every day. And in order to be perfect, you have to provide the most impeccable customer service. Yes, they have over 1,000 new and pre-owned vehicles available to select from. They're open extended hours in all of their departments to better service you. You can shop over 10 acres of savings opportunities or go online 24-7 at mohawkhonda.com. And, yes, they will provide you the lowest no-hassle prices to better suit your budget. At Mohawk Honda, they have over 180 trained automotive experts going above and beyond to make sure all of your needs are met. And you can just ask Tiffany, Katie, or V-Day how easy is it to get involved in their Mohawk Exchange program in which you can upgrade your current vehicle to a newer one with no money down for the same or lower payment. So shop their convenient Route 50 in Glenville location to join the number one automotive family at Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. AFC, NFC championships. They're this weekend. Who's going to the Super Bowl? We ask RPI graduate and current Miami Dolphins kicker Andrew Franks joins us next. It's Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. Ah, uh, yes, we are back, and we are on the phone right now with Miami Dolphins kicker, former RPI kicker Andrew Franks. Andrew, last year at this time, you're at RPI. You're getting ready to graduate. You're getting ready for the NFL draft. Now you're coming off your first season in the NFL. Have you stopped to think about how crazy this last year has been? Uh, yeah. No, looking back, it's sort of just a crazy turn of events, really, you know. And it's sort of hard. To, it's really hard to believe, even from myself, that, you know, I'm sort of in this position now. I want to get the random stuff out of the way, but it is the stuff I'm most interested in. You've had a full year of it now. What's your thoughts on the new extra point distance? How did it work out? Um, you know, early in the season, it was definitely a little weirder. Uh, you know, it was a little, a little uh, out of the way for me. So, um, but you know, after a couple weeks of dealing with that, uh, you sort of get used to it and realize that you really got to focus more on it. So, uh, it's, uh, it's now it's normal. So I guess it's not a big deal anymore. <laughs> the thing I wanted to ask you the most is, is two weeks ago, I was watching the Seahawks Vikings playoff game and Blair Walsh misses the kick at the end of the game it was a 27 yarder most people were regarded as a chip shot what are you a fellow kicker thinking as you watch one of your uh, your, your brethren miss a kick like that uh, it, it kills me it really kills me man uh, you know to miss a kick like that to make their team win the game uh, it hurts it hurts you know I mean most of the time you know no one's going to really remember the 20, 30 kicks that we make before that. It's the one kick that uh, we missed. So uh, that, it really hurts to watch a kicker like that. Uh, miss that. Now, that game was played in, in negative temperatures. Now, you haven't played a game like that in Miami, but you played your fair share of cold games up here at RPI. Just how hard is it to kick in the extreme cold like that? Oh, it's, 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 it's really difficult, for sure. You know, the whole body is cold. The joints don't really work same way the ball is basically a rock so you know it's truly a different game when it gets that cold miami dolphins kicker andrew franks former rpi kicker with us on capital region sports saturday brought to you by mohawk honda and andrew you guys down in miami you missed the playoffs you go through an early season coaching change now adam gaze comes in he gets the job the former bears offensive coordinator what was it like for you guys trying to keep it together as all these coaching changes were going on around you this year you know i think as a team for the most part we just tried to solidify amongst ourselves really just realize that you know we can have as many coaches as you know as they want but you know at the end of the day it's going to be up to us whether we want to win and be successful what's the keys for you guys in 2016 to try to supplant the patriots that's what everyone in the afc east is trying to do but what are the keys for you guys to get on top of the of the division next year uh, that's a great question uh, i wish i knew the answer <laughs> <laughs> but you know i think for right now it's just sort of a realizing our potential and just trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, try to do that every day. Miami Dolphins kicker Andrew Franks with us. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. He's the former kicker at RPI. And, Andrew, we're getting ready for the AFC and NFC Championships tomorrow. Tom Brady and the Patriots, what makes New England so good? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, as a whole, I mean, they're – down team they don't make mistakes you know it's very they don't beat themselves up for the most part so you know that makes it that makes a team really hard to beat i think when you think about the nfc game you got a prediction on carolina and arizona 
Um, yeah, no, I think I think Carolina's going to pull it out, you know, and uh, and I'm pretty sure Carolina uh, is going to win the whole thing. So, I mean, that's that's my prediction at least. How crazy is it to think that it that a season ago you're playing Division Three athletics? And look, I played Division Three athletics. There are some great players in Division Three, but now you're seeing guys like uh, you know, like Cam Newton. You're playing in the same league as those guys. So talk about just the jump in competition from uh, in one year here. Yeah, no, everyone's a lot bigger. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, for the most part, I mean, it's just almost a different game, you know. These guys are, you know, ton bigger than Division Three, uh, faster. So it's to me, it's just a super, you know, it's a lot more competitive, and it's just, you know, it's it's really just crazy. I'm sure we'll get you a local question here and then get you out. I'm sure you, uh, there's no love lost for the fact that Union went 0 10 this year, but the Dutchman just hired a new coach and uh, and they're going to look to try to take away the Dutchman shoes uh, from RPI next year. Is any shot at that happening? Um, I doubt it. I doubt it. You know, it still does suck to hear that they did go uh, 0 and 10. But you know, as long as you know, as long as RPI keeps the shoes, you know, I have I have no issues with their record. Spoken like a true engineer, former RPI kicker Andrew Franks with us, Capital Region Sports Saturday, brought to you by Mohawk Honda. He's the current kicker for the Miami Dolphins. Andrew, thanks for spending a couple uh, a couple of minutes with us this morning. Best of luck in 2016. We look forward to seeing you and the Dolphins back out on the field. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. That's two weeks in a row now. NFL players for us on Capital Region Sports Saturday. Last week it was Brian Parker, you Albany graduate, or you Albany product who plays with the Kansas City Chiefs. He's a, a secondary tight end on that roster. We talked with him last week, Andrew Franks this week. So the guest list, the quality is growing every week here on Capital Region Sports Saturday. And Andrew Franks says he doesn't think Union's going to take back the uh, the Dutchman Shoes Trophy. I, I think with Jeff Berriman, as we just talked about, I think he's going to help the uh, the Dutchman program get back on track. And I wouldn't be shocked. If Union's got the shoes back in their possession within a year or two here. and uh, But Andrew Franks, Dolphins kicker, and uh, and just unbelievable story. He goes from Division Three RPI to the NFL, supplants so starter Caleb Sturgis in the, uh, right, right out of training camp, and he gets the job, and he wins it, and he keeps it the entire year. So great story. We're happy to have him on as well. Another great story going on in the Capital Region that we're not talking about enough, Siena women's basketball. The Saints win last night. They beat Kenesha 61-57. Sienna's now 8-1 and one in the MAC. 8-1 and one for Allie Jacks and company in the MAC. And Sienna, remember, this is a program that is coming from the bottom. Sienna went 11-9 and nine in the league last year and advanced to the CBI championship game. Remember, they were out at, uh, at Lafayette in April playing in the CBI championship game. So they go 11-9 and nine last year. But before that, 3-17 and 17 in the league. So she has really started to build this program up three and 17, 11 and nine. Now they're eight and one. And you don't even know what the limit could go to. You don't even know where Sienna can go this year. They are playing well. They're playing inside and outside and they are healthy. Remember last year, they were decimated, decimated by injuries. They are healthy. Now, uh, Allie Jacks after the game yesterday, a win for the saints over Canisius. Hard fought win. I, you know, Canisius is one of those matchups that's tough because they can all shoot the ball and they proved it tonight. I was impressed with our ability to knock down some big shots, but it's really good to see Megan Donnie have a night like that. You know, we've needed her to get going and to have some balance uh, scoring inside out. Um, you know, I think that was really important for us. Just sounds like a coach and she knows what she's doing in Loudonville. Saints are really playing well. Coach Abe and company at U Albany have been at the tournament four years in a row. They get the notoriety locally. They did smoke the Saints in the Albany Cup. But Allie Jacks has this team playing better and better every single day. So it, it is a real possibility. You could see two local women's teams playing in the NCAA tournament if Sienna can, uh, can continue this momentum in the MAC. Mayor's Cup tonight, Times Union Center, RPI and Union. RPI has won five of the last six games for the Dutchman. They've only lost two of their last 11 games. So they've only lost two of their last 11 games, but they're winless in their last four as well. So a number, too many ties for Rick Bennett and company. They haven't beaten an ECAC opponent since they beat Clarkson on November 7th. And in this four-game winless streak for the Dutchman, they are 60th in Division One in penalty kill. 60th. That is dead last. Dead last for the Dutchman in their last four games, in this four-game winless streaks. They are in the penalty kill just over 50%. I think they're 9 for 16. That is not going to get it done. If this game gets physical, gets intense like rivalries do, 
then Union is in trouble, at least they're uh, in, in the same market that they were in in the last four games. So RPI and Union, NFL picks this weekend. Cue the music. AFC, NFC championship games. Patriots, Broncos, the early game in the AFC. Patriots are healthy. Tom Brady gets rid of the ball quick. Denver has an elite defense. They have playmakers all over the place. They have big hitters in the secondary. They have guys who are fearless in the secondary. They have a good pass rush. They have Von Miller. But Tom Brady finds a way to just get rid of the ball quickly. You saw what he did against Seattle in the Super Bowl last year. You saw what he did against the Jets two times this year. He has the ability to... To, to just be a chameleon. Patriots won't run the ball. They won't even attempt to run the ball. They'll use that short passing game. Amendola, Edelman, they are back. They are healthy. And the Patriots will win the game 29-16. to 16. I think Peyton Manning looks better than we think he will. But it won't be good enough. I think the Broncos will get down in the red zone a few times and have to settle for some field goals early. Patriots will keep it close. And they'll extend it out late 29-16. NFC Panthers impressed me last week. They they destroyed my Seahawks for the first half. We're up 31 to nothing before you could even blink. We're up 31 nothing. The Cardinals are going into Carolina as the number two seed in the NFC. They are very good on the outside. Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown. They've got playmakers all over in the wide receivers court. Carson Palmer can really sling it. But the Carolina pass rush is the key to that game. You saw what they did to Russell Wilson, forced him into two uncharacteristic turnovers last week, two bad interceptions. They were able to sack him. They were able to contain him for the most part. And Carson Palmer's mobility is no Russell Wilson. Cam Newton and company dabbing all the way to the Super Bowl, 31-27. The Panthers beat the Cardinals tomorrow. That game, the late game in the NFC. Capital Region Sports Saturday brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. You already loses to Stony Brook. What was the turning point of the game? You Albany broadcaster Zach By joins us live next. Capital Region Sports Saturday with Brady Farkas, sponsored by Mohawk Honda. You Albany loses to Stony Brook last night by a score of 69-63 in a battle of America East foes. That game was nationally televised on ESPNU. And you Albany men's basketball broadcaster Zach By now joining us on Capital Region Sports Saturday. Zach, you with us? Yes, I am, sir. Zach, I know you, uh, let's get full disclosure out there. This game was 9 o'clock last night. It ended around 11, a little after. You drove through the night to beat the snow. I know you just woke up to be with us, so we appreciate that. Did you make it home okay? How was the snow started yet? Yeah, no, the, the, the snow uh, had started as we were uh, coming outside after the game, and we traveled with a, a local writer uh, from the Times Union who had made the trip. So we didn't get out of there until uh, midnight, and, uh, I wasn't in my bed until after five o'clock in the morning, Oof. which uh, which has been done before. Believe me, <laughs> typically those are voluntary moves, and uh, this was just a, 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 a you know circumstantial night. But it was all worth it. What a what a great game! What a great atmosphere! Uh, last night is uh, is why you know you do what you do. Uh, if you're a fan of mid major basketball, last night was tailor made for you. Now, you said yesterday on the Jeff LeVac show, and I played the clip earlier, that when you look at a game, you look at three stats. You look at what you call the toughness stats. Free throws attempted, uh, free throws attempted, rebounding points margin, point. and points yep. in the paint. You already tied Sony Brook points in the paint. They shot one more free throw, but they were out-rebounded by 13 by the Seawolves. Was that the difference in the game to you? Well, yeah, it was the difference. And the, and the major thing was that at halftime, Albany was plus one on the rebounding margin. And they were out rebounded by 15 rebounds in the second half, and ultimately that was the difference. I mean, really, if that basketball game came down to a couple rebounds off missed free throws that ended up resulting into points. I mean, it felt like with three minutes left in the basketball game, Brady, that Albany was going to win again. I mean, it it felt like last year, low scoring, grinded out, slugfest offensively challenged, and, uh, you know, it, and there was a couple toughness plays down the stretch of the game that uh, that won the game for Stony Brook. But, but I'll say this, if you're a fan of Albany basketball, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. There was a strange feeling that we had felt before with about three or four minutes left uh, in that arena last night, and uh, it, it felt like things were going to break Albany's way yet again, but that's not the way it turned out. Those guys got it done, and uh, they hold serve. 
if you're you Albany, yeah, I'm with you in the fact that the game played out almost exactly as you wanted. You kept Jamil Warney, the, the two-time reigning player of the year, on the bench in foul trouble most of the first half. You held him to 17 points, which I, I think that's a win for Will Brown and company. The game played out like you wanted, and you were up. People look at the final score and say you Albany lost by six. They were up one with under 40 seconds to play. That's right. That's right. And, and that's why. You know, listen, Stony Brook won the game, and Stony Brook is probably going to win the league. They are a very good basketball team. Um, but I got to tell you, and this is unbiased, I, I and you know me from coming on the air and even the things I said yesterday and, and picking Stony Brook to win, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys who is always going to lean one way or the other because of the school that pays me. But I'll say this. I don't think Stony Brook wants to play Albany in a postseason because the, the way that that game felt last night, and, and it, it seems like you felt the same thing, it was like, you know what, Albany's going to do this again to these guys. And Stony Brook has all the measurables. They have more talent on paper. You know, they have a borderline NBA player with Jameel Warney, who, by the way, I'm sitting next to directly last night, a Miami Heat scout and a Utah Jazz scout uh, there to watch him. Um, you, you would think that that Stony Brook, you know, they were almost a double-digit spread. And then, as you said, under 40 seconds left, Albany's got a one-point lead, and you're going, oh, my goodness, these guys are just cursed. Will Brown is in the heads of these guys. But, uh, like I said, they, make, they, they, they made a couple plays, a couple toughness plays, um, uh, you know, bad bounces off rebounds. Greg Steyer, how about that? Picks up a foul away from the basketball that sends Jamil Warren to the line when Albany was up one. Um, it was just a, a couple a couple plays off happenstance, but give Stony Brook credit. They did what they needed to do. They protected home court. They're probably going to win the league. Albany's going to need some help now. Uh, but, again, I, I think this thing is going to come down to these two teams again. I really do. I think Stony Brook is going to probably finish at the top of the league. And Albany, if they can play like they did last night, uh, will finish second in the league. And when, I, I really believe that in another month and a half, when we talk, that game is going to be at Stony Brook again, and they're going to have to beat Albany for a third time. It's just going to be very interesting. We've talked a lot about Joe Cremo uh, coming off the bench. Yesterday, he only gets six points and, and been in double figures seemingly every game. We're on the phone right now with Zach By, the UAB men's basketball broadcaster. But the guy off the bench for me, who I think is going to be huge for UAB down the stretch, is a guy we don't talk about very much, and that's Dallas Enema. He had seven points yesterday. He comes in. He can shoot the three well. He seems to, to have some spotty playing time. Seems like the one guy who kind of gets in Will Brown's doghouse, and one day he's playing 15 minutes, the next day he's playing seven. But he's a guy, I think, who can really elevate this team. Do you agree? I do agree. And in a game last night that, you know, where Albany is in foul trouble, they don't have a lot of depth at the front court. They had a kid named Travis Charles who comes out of New York City who was a terrific player and was getting major minutes in the first portion of the season. He's got some sort of gastro issue, and he's likely going to miss the rest of the year. They had a kid named Chaz Brown uh, for the preseason who ended up withdrawing from school. So they don't have a lot of the same pieces as far as traditional front court players. So Dallas Enema who is really naturally a swing man, uh, is playing the four, and he's come in and made some plays. He was coming off the 8.5 rebound performance against Binghamton and came in the last night and hit some threes at instrumental points in the game. Uh, but he also made some other you know plays that down the stretch of the game that weren't by design and Albany didn't get the exact look that they wanted when he kind of took the game into his own hands. But you know what? As a player, you expect a guy to go out and try to make a play uh, he thought he had a good look at the basket with under a minute left. Um, and uh, and I, I respect him for for pulling the trigger on it. And to your to your question, I think that's a guy, you know, him along with a guy like Joe Cremo at the, at the smaller forward position, it's, they're going to need. I mean, they're going to need everyone to beat a team like Stony Brook because of how talented they are. And Dallas Enema is sort of you can label like an X factor, which I believe that you were trying to, you know, get to that with with, with him, and and he is a guy that can come off the bench and hit three threes or four threes in a game. I've seen him do it before, and in Peter Hooley's absence last year, he started you know double digit games and averaged uh, nearly ten points during that stretch. So that is a guy that uh, you you have in your back pocket uh, that can come off the bench and provide you a boost. 
Speaking of Peter Hooley, he's having one of the weirdest seasons I can recall. He's got 29 one night. He's got two the next night, four, seven, 18. He has 13 last night. He's starting to shoot it a little better. Is he coming out of this kind of inconsistent funk that he's been in? Yeah, you're starting to see signs of it. Uh, for a while there, uh, if you were a fan of Albany basketball, you were you were scratching your head. It was hard to watch because you've seen this kid be a top five scorer in school history. He's one of the great players in school history. Uh, he's a top five uh, assist man in school history. And every time he's been able to win a championship or eligible to, he's won one. You know, this is his fourth year eligibility, uh, fifth year at the school, but he's got three for three uh, as far as titles. And, and then this year, uh, for whatever reason, confidence has wavered or what have you. Uh, but excuses aside, uh, it's been woeful at times. I mean, he hasn't. He's had these performances where he's two for eleven and things like that, and shooting fifteen percent from three over a fifteen-game sample size is concerning. But in the last three games, he's you know getting about twenty points a night. Uh, he had twenty-nine uh, at Maine, followed up with eighteen against Binghamton, and played pretty well last night. And numbers aside, because his numbers are going to be bad for the year because the way he started the first half of the year. The bottom line is if Albany's going to cut down the nets for a fourth consecutive year, they need that guy playing like the all-conference guard that we expected uh, That and, and, and the expectation that he set before us for the last four years. Um, so I, 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 I hope for, for Albany's uh, standpoint that he can become more consistent because that's the biggest question mark. As, to your question, hey, you say, hey, how can he go from 29 to 24 or, or 29 to 4 and they just need a steady hand out of that position. You and it, it seems like the last three games he's, he's getting closer to that point. You Albany men's basketball broadcaster Zach By braved the elements last night to uh, to get back to town. Joins us this morning after about three and a half hours of sleep. Zach, we got 30 seconds left. We'll switch the gears on you. LeVac and I are going to the Super Bowl. Which two teams are we going to be uh, following when we're out there in, uh, in Santa Clara? Who you got tomorrow? You know, you know what? My gut tells me that those Arizona Cardinals are going to find a way. The Panthers have been too inconsistent from one half to another throughout the course of the entire season. And then on the other side, tomorrow, I can't see how Peyton Manning's offense is going to outscore Brady. I'm taking the Patriots, and I'm weighing the points, brother. Absolutely. Zach, by with us. Uh, you all men's basketball broadcaster. Love having him on. Zach, go back to bed, and, uh, and thanks for being on with us. I'm on my way. Thanks, dude. <laughs> Sounds good, Zach. Thanks a lot. Zach By, you all men's basketball broadcaster with us, Capital Region Sports Saturday, brought to you by Mohawk Honda, your number one volume dealer in the Capital Region. And at Mohawk Honda, remember, they have over 1,000 new and pre-owned vehicles available to select from, open extended hours in all their departments. You can shop over 10 acres of savings opportunities or go online 24-7 at mohawkhonda.com, and they'll provide you the lowest no-hassle price to better suit your budget. Budget A business can have all of that, but without providing the customer with the professional service experience they have always been looking for and deserve, you deserve it. Nothing else matters. Mohawk Honda has over 180 trained automotive experts going above and beyond to make sure all your needs are met. Being number one isn't easy, but at Mohawk Honda, they treat their customers with respect and have been doing it for almost 100 years, four generations of the Herodin family proudly serving the Capital Region. Shop their convenient Route 50 in Glenville location to join the number one automotive family, truly family, the key word, at Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. Recapping today's show, JV on Oganyemi, the reason why Sienna will stay afloat in the MAC, you all, but he loses to uh, Stony Brook last night in a nationally televised game on ESPNU. The Mayor's Cup tonight, RPI in Union. RPI has won five of the last six NFL picks tomorrow. we got the Patriots over the Broncos, 29-16, and the Panthers, I'm going against Zach, Panthers over... Uh, over the Cardinals, 31-27 in Charlotte. Until next week, Capital Region Sports Saturday, brought to you by Mohawk Honda and 104.5 The Team.